uh, in that period. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, you see, slight change of title. Uh, I'm actually going to be doing 1124 to 1214, slightly longer period. Uh, okay, so politi uh, political assemblies have been high on the scholars' agenda recently, and rightly so, for thinking about assemblies can offer valuable insight into how kingdoms functioned uh, before royal bureaucracies became continuously functioning entities. Just about anything affecting the kingdom can happen at an assembly or provide the occasion for one, whether an existential, political, uh, military, or succession crisis, trouble with the pope, disputes among magnates, promulgation of new laws, royal weddings, and on and on. Some scholars have attempted to group these according to topic, but I find that like most things in medieval life, assemblies really refuse to be categorized. <clears throat> Indeed, um, Timothy Reuter, in his now sem seminal piece on assembly uh, politics in Western Europe from the 8th century to the 12th, comments on the difficulty of even distinguishing what made up an assembly. I'll agree here with his definition as uh, whenever the ruler had in his presence a substantial number of people who were not permanent members of his entourage. Today I'm going to see what we can learn from chronicles, uh, law codes, and charters about assemblies at both Schoon and Perth uh, between 1124 and about 1214 and make a few conclusions about their significance. Okay. Uh, all right, oh dear, the formatting, this is not a good sign. Uh, anyway, these are the, um, the royal inaugurations that took place during that time. Five kings were raised to the throne between 1107 and 1214. Although chronicles tell us nothing about the inaugurations of Alexander I and his brother David, and this is the age that they were when they became king in parentheses. Um, the extremely brief notices of Malcolm and William's inaugurations emphasize the performance of popular consent that was crucial to medieval kingmaking. John of Hexham writes that the whole people of the land raised up Malcolm. The 13th century chronicle known as Gesta Analia I depicts the prelates and lords at Schoon setting up William as king. On Christmas Eve, the Bishop of St. Andrews, with other bishops to help him, consecrated the king and raised him to the king's throne. The same source gives much more detail about the inauguration of Alexander II in 1214 and fills in more of the scene in terms of attendees. Unlike William, who waited over two weeks after the death of his predecessor to be made king, the teenaged Alexander rushed to Schoon and was inaugurated the next day. Indeed, in 1214, the dying king orchestrated the acceptance of his son by bishops, earls, and barons at Stirling, where he died. Those really necessary for the ceremony, seven named um, earls and the bishop of St. Andrews accompanied the king to Schoon, while others turned up for the three nights of feasting that followed. As David Brun has observed, Malcolm IV was likely inaugurated at Schoon only three days after the death of King David in Carlisle on the 24th of May. 1153. These quickie inaugurations were probably due more to unstable political situations in 1153 and 1214 than to the young age of the new kings. And I wonder if the relatively long wait for William's ceremony had something to do with its date, Christmas Eve, and the feasting and celebration which inevitably followed. Indeed, recent scholarship has highlighted that most medieval political assemblies <laughs> lasted a few days and sought to cement the social bonds of elites through shared frivolity, not unlike 21st century academic conferences. Perhaps William waited to allow his inauguration to co coincide with the customary Christmas royal court assembly and to plan for a more elaborate celebration, and that would certainly fit with our impression of him as something of a bon vivant. Schoon's position was well established by the 12th century, as we've already heard. Um, it appears as a royal kivitas in the Chronicle of the Kings of Alaba, 906, and Alexander I established the um, Augustinian Priory there. 
and Schoon was one of the four royal manaria of Gowry, uh, which is the part of Perthshire roughly between where we are and the border with Angus. So what's less often appreciated is that all the 12th century references to sheriffs in this area use the title Sheriff of Schoon, and that Gowry and Schoon were alternative titles for the sheriffs of Perth through the 13th century. Moreover, the Lega Scotiae, collection of royal assizes and adjudications of the reign of William the Lion, lists Schoon as the place where warranters from Gowry must come. These suggest a continuing important role, uh, both administrative and political, for Schoon throughout this period. The evidence of charters adds a further dimension. Of the 102 charters, briefs, it's the Scottish word for writs, and other documents of King David with surviving place dates from within the kingdom, um, 12 are dated at Schoon and um, only five at Perth. Situation under David's grandsons suggests a remarkable shift. As you can see, for Malcolm, there's none at Schoon and 12 at Perth and only one at Schoon for William, 46 at Perth. But then under their successors, Alexander II, 1214 to 49, and Alexander III, 1249 to 86, um, we see again a shift to Schoon uh, with you know, many more at Schoon than at Perth. Um, this, uh, the importance of Schoon only grows in the period after this with King John, the first, or John Balliol, and Robert the first, um, using Schoon for their parliaments, which I think is probably a very deliberate attempt to use the legitimizing force of its history for these new dynasties. All right, here's a map of the area. Why the shift from Schoon to Perth under Kings Malcolm and William? I would suggest that Perth gradually usurped Schoon's position as a major assembly site in the second half of the 12th century. There were probably several reasons for this. The growing borough offered the closest thing to uh, urban sophistication that the kingdom offered. And more importantly, many of the guests almost certainly had permanent houses there, including um, perhaps the bishops of St. Andrews and Dunkeld, Chamberlain, Stuart, and so forth. The king also had a residence here. And um, I have to ask the archaeologists here, but I think that the new stone castle was built, um, you know, in the middle of the 12th century. Um, and I think that, yeah, this castle uh, with the north inch, which was sometimes called the king's itch, could have provided the suitable um, geographical space for these assemblies to take place. And I think, of course, when you look at it from the bird's eye view, uh, the castle, uh, which is about here, um, actually seems to have backed directly onto the edge. You could have had, you know, the tents and horses and things there. And then, of course, if there was some court, I mean, this is just pure speculation, but if there was some kind of a boat, you could actually go directly on from there to Schoon itself. Um, what happened seems clear enough to me was that there was a big flood in 1209. The castle was washed away, a lot of the town was washed away, the bridge was washed away. And uh, the castle was not rebuilt, the town was growing so much, there was a lack of space, and even the sheriff of Scoob moved his storehouses out to Kinclaven upriver. So um, there's a sense that Perth was becoming very crowded, and they, this move back to Scoon seems to have been uh, based on that. And I also wonder if by this time that the, the buildings at Schoon, the complex was big enough to perhaps house the king there, as he, we know that sometimes kings stayed in um, residences at, at monasteries. Okay. Chronicle evidence is able to fill in some of the context for the assemblies that were held at Perth during this time. First mention, um, Perth and the Chronicles is really the famous incident when Malcolm returns from Languedoc, from Toulouse, campaigning with Henry II in late 1159 to a very chilly reception from six of his Morver, uh, which is the Scottish predecessor of the Earl, 
uh, who so supposedly besiege him in Perth. Um, although the guest and Gesta Analia makes it very clear that uh, this was only out of their concern for the safety of the kingdom and not a true act of rebellion. I, I wonder if what really was happening here was that there was an assembly, customary assembly, that the earls were attending as they were normally expected to do, but that their heated disagreement over the king, leaving the kingdom, um, their great fear that he might give away the farm, so to speak, to Henry, uh, perhaps led them to prevent the king from exiting, if you like, um, or something like along those lines. But I do wonder if an assembly was really what underlied that famous incident. Uh, unsurprisingly, the Chronicles tell a lot about ecclesiastical affairs, uh, but they do suggest that Perth was becoming, even though it's not the seat of a bishop, its central location uh, and also the somewhat peripheral location of St. Andrews, the site of the premier bishop, um, it seems to have been growing as a center for church councils during this period. Um, but, and also while the, ch the, the bishops themselves were consecrated at cathedrals, they were often elected or appointed at councils at Perth. So we hear that um, in 1174, Jocelyn Abbot of Melrose was elected Bishop of Glasgow in Perth. Um, that William, King of Scots, called together the bishops and chief men of his land to the Villa of Perth and gave the bishopric of St. Andrews to his chancellor, Roger, in 1189. Um, the king made his, then made his Clark Hugh of Roxburgh the new chancellor. And this sort of thing happened at these assemblies a lot, where you have kind of a cabinet reshuffle, if you like. Um, there, but we also start to hear around 1,200 of church synods for example, 1201 and 1206, and also when the papal legate John de Salerno came around that time, he held a three-day church council in Perth. Um, and it was in 1201 when uh, William Malvisa, the Bishop of Glasgow, was translated to the Bishop of St. Andrews. So these are the very top-level um, ecclesiastical events of the kingdom. And notices like these, of course, can give us the false impression that the main business of these assemblies was church business. Um, obviously, that's um, more a reflection of the documents which were produced and preserved. Um, but we know from what we know generally about assemblies across Europe that uh, political negotiations and impressing matters of state were really the main order of business at, at assemblies. And we know, for example, that Bishop Roger negotiated with Harold, Earl of Orkney, at Perth in 1202. And also Archie Duncan's work on Perth um, suggested that there was a big assembly here in 1209 when that flood happened, where they were, the, the king was um, raising money that he owed to King John of England. And they all had to adjourn down to Stirling and finish their business there because of the, uh, the flood. Right. Now, luckily, for this, um, you know, wanting to know more about the secular side, we have the survival of these law codes, uh, which Alice Taylor has done so much to bring to, to light. Now, um, these law codes often tell us the place where these new laws were promulgated, these assize, assizes of the kings, and as you can see here, Perth was by far the most common during this period, um, with four, possibly even more, uh, Perth and one at, further one at Schoon. I've got that wrong. That actually should be 1214 at Schoon. Um, it's the first chapter in the Statutes of King Alexander, and Alice Taylor thinks that it dates to the actual inauguration ceremony itself, the one where we saw Alexander three days of feasting at Schoon and so forth. Uh, and that is interesting because it mentions the Common Council of the Earls, Usually they mention the council of the earls, barons, knights, etc. And as we saw, the seven earls were the main people who accompanied Alexander for the inauguration ceremony, whereas many of the other people stayed with, the, with King William's body, which then came and met them to go on to our growth. Um, and you can see here that, that some of the other places where legislative assemblies were held, Stirling, Aberdeen, Roxburgh, um, 
And as might be expected, these are always presented as kind of the consensus of the king's elite. Kingdom's elite, the earls and barons, bishops and abbots are most frequently mentioned. They're sometimes joined by the thanes and eudices or lawmen of Scotland. Um, and when we use the term Scotland at this time, it doesn't mean the whole kingdom, but only the area that was known in Latin as Scotia or Albania, um, really referring to the area between the Firth of Forth and the River Spey. <clears throat> um, yeah, Alice Taylor notes in a recent paper that that last, that 1201, 1221 assembly in Perth um, is about having to pay fines for failing to show up for your army service and that that was enacted by all the lawmen of Scotland in the presence of the Lord King, uh, which is kind of the reverse of what you would normally see. So the King is actually um, consenting to the law that the lawmen have, have enacted. And that is, gives us a great hint, I think, to the fact that these assemblies were much more consensual in nature, uh, much less top-down kind of affairs that you'll see in later medieval kingship. Okay, this, also, this gives you a sense here of what the uh, 12th and early 13th century um, kingdom looked like. To them, Scotland really meant Scotia or Albania, the, the real heart of the kingdom that, that the kings had used as their base to expand into the other uh, regions. And this is David Brune has uh, demonstrated this extensively that it's really much more like a collection of countries under one king and with their own legal traditions. And the king has a different relationship, if you like, with each of these countries. And if you'll notice here, we, don't, we know very little about Murray, um, for, so I won't presume to mention anything about that. But um, you can see here that these, the locations of these um, kind of suggest one or two main places for each of these um, separate lands. And uh, Alice Taylor suggests that the choice of Sterling, as you can see, um, had been to... Um, promulgate laws which were in effect for both Sco uh, Scotia and Lothian. And, um, you know, that, that this, its location there on that border between the two was because um, these laws were meant to be for more, you know, both of those countries. Right. <clears throat> so there's clear evidence that the laws that were promulgated in Lothian were for use in Lothian. And the ones that were um, you know, passed in Perth were really for use within just this core country of Scotia. Um, so we obviously don't have enough space here today to talk about the specific laws and the place of enactment and how those relate. Um, but the main issues that they deal with are things to do with theft, people who are accused of theft, and oversight of the private courts held by barons, earls, bishops, etc., by the king's sheriffs, which is a big change that happens at this time. <clears throat> right. So obviously, in other words, those are the kinds of issues that these assemblies were discussing. And I suspect that these legislative assemblies, again, could have been the very same assemblies that we've seen doing other kinds of activities. Um, I also wonder whether the description of the years in these law codes might give us a hint about what people were discussing at these assemblies, such as the visit of a papal legate in 1177 to deal with English claims over Scottish churches, the coronation of a French king in 1180, or the arrival of Henry, Duke of Saxony, at the English court in 1184. King William had attended Henry II's court to discuss a possible marriage to Henry the lion's daughter, Maud, the previous summer. And at the time of the assembly, messengers were at the papal curia attempting and failing to get permission for this marriage. Um, so the impending marriage of the king, which would have been the first royal marriage in um, over 50 years, you know, was probably one of the things that they were discussing, and that's why they used it as, as the way to uh, date that. <clears throat> 
All right. Well, a final point about the law codes is that um, one very important uh, activity that we see going on there um, and tied up with ritual or performance or however you like to think of these things was oath taking. And for example, the 1197 um, assembly at Perth um, saw the bishops, abbots, earls, barons, and thanes swear an oath that they would not maintain uh, thieves, murderers, or plunderers. So this again underlines the centrality of Perth as the place where power was exercised for this central uh, country of Scotia. I do tend to call it Albania to myself, but that does start to, especially when you combine it with Moravia as Murray, you really feel like you've wandered into Eastern Europe. So um, the, the chronicle and um, legal evidence has demonstrated, I hope you'll agree, the you know, central importance of Perth and Schoon. And I now want to consider briefly what charters um, can color in the, uh, this picture. Um, right. We have very little evidence from charters to suggest that there were uh, dispositive assemblies uh, in conjunction with the inauguration ceremonies, uh, except for that legislative assembly that we saw mentioned at Schoon. The famous charter of David I uh, to Robert de Bruce in 1124 was almost certainly dated at his enthronement at Schoon, but its witness list suggests um, his kind of nightly entourage rather than an assembly. And that actually is not surprising because um, you know, a charter dealing with Annandale in 1124 um, really has nothing to do with the authority of an assembly at Schoon. That's, if you like, a different country from Scotia at this time. Um, so as we've seen, Schoon was almost never used by Malcolm and William. And uh, we don't have any inauguration assembly evidence from them, although we may from Perth. <clears throat> but you do occasionally get charters that seem to match up with some of the other assemblies. For example, the 1189 um, appointment of Roger as um, Bishop of St. Andrews, you get a, a good witness list of 22 people with a number of named bishops and earls and so on. So you get to see the attendance. And if we're thinking about assemblies as mainly events where people who are not normally in the royal entourage, you know, who makes an assembly an assembly, I would, because you do occasionally get a bishop or head of a religious house or an earl going along with the king in his usual, um, you know, route, but um, it's when you get multiple bishops, um, you know, multiple numbers of um, heads of religious house, earls, those are the ones who really stick out. Right. Um, it is possible to identify a number of further assemblies just using the charter evidence. Um, as we've seen, larger than usual concentrations of bishops and prelates as well as earls surely point to important gatherings. Uh, and this is also sometimes indicated by the appearance of a high profile visitor. King David's 1140 charters are marked by the attendance of Robert de Sigillo. Um, the envoy of Empress Matilda down in England. And these may point to sort of political negotiations around those wars. <clears throat> As Archie Duncan has shown, these charters also began the uh, setting up the framework for the new Augustinian foundation at St. Andrews. Um, so this is charters of David the first numbers, 86, 87, et cetera. And you can see some of the attendees at that assembly at Perth. And uh, what I would suggest is that these other charters dated at Schoon may basically be from the same assembly. And obviously this uh, involves a bit of... Uh, <laughs> You have to sort of buy into the argument, if you like. There's no guarantee that these things happen at the same time. But I would, the fact that Robert de Sigillo is also in attendance may suggest that these things belong together. And I, but I also think this highlights the point that Perth and Schoon should probably not be seen in isolation from each other, that these assemblies may have actually 
you know, involved flitting between the two places. And um, I would go further and basically suggest that what we know about 12th century politics uh, might imply that most of the charters and other documents that were produced at these kinds of places actually stemmed from these assemblies, even when you don't have the sort of grandiose witness list. And for example, we have these. This is all the, the uh, collection of, I think, 10 documents from the beginning of King William's reign, dated at Perth. And uh, basically, you have a very short window between when he was inaugurated at Schoon and when he, in December, uh, Christmas, uh, December 1165, then you had, in March, he went off down to France. And I kind of, this, these are basically mostly for religious houses, St. Andrews, Cooper, Schoon, the Isle of May. And I kind of see this bevy of um, monks and canons uh, kind of descending on the king as he's, um, you know, uh, just been inaugurated and before he's about to set off. And essentially this whole uh, group of charters could all be kind of produced in one big spurt of activity. Um, so I'm just going to try to conclude. <laughs> <clears throat> In fact, a large number of all the royal charters were dated at these kinds of assembly sites, like the main ones we saw from the legislative assemblies. 55% of the documents of David and Malcolm date from Perth, Schoon, Stirling, Aberdeen, Edinburgh, and Roxburgh. And um, there's also this tendency for the, the business of the charters, if you like, to um, be from the same land or country as the place date, if you know what I mean. So things dated at Edinburgh tend to deal with Lothian and so forth. But that, um, that tendency is much, much more pronounced when you look at Perth. Almost all the charters produced in Perth and Schoon are dealing with the country, if you like, of Scotia or Albania. And this is particularly true with lay charters. Um, and for example, 10 of the 11 charters of William to lay beneficiaries dated at Perth in the first 30 years of his realm um, are dealing with lands in Perthshire, Fife, and Angus, the real core region of Scotia. And 100% of all of Malcolm IV's documents dated at Perth, the, both the beneficiary and the possessions are within the core region of Scotia. So, uh, I think that those patterns, together with the preeminence of Perth in terms of promulgating law, laws that dealt only for the inhabitants of the core country of Scotia or Albania, suggest that you, we've got a basically a long-standing customary assembly, which is um, expected to meet at Schoon or Perth, and um, which I suspect during this period it wasn't even really necessary for the king to be present at. But I won't, we don't have time to go into that possibility, obviously. Um, this is reflected, for example, in the expansive nature of the sheriffdom of Perth. It incorporated this, remember, there was a law that said the sheriffs had oversight now of all the private courts. Of the nine places where the warranters were to come, four of them were in the sheriffdom of Perth. Of all of the earldoms, Athol, Strathern, and most of Menteith were in Perth, the provinces of Gowrie and Stormont as well. So a huge chunk of the central part of the kingdom fell under the authority of the sheriff of Perth. And I think that is an incredibly powerful statement of the um, that Perth and Schoon together were the focus for the exercise of power within Albania. And I would even go so far as to say that essentially Perth and Schoon were the capital of the original country of Scotland, Scotia, or Albania. I'll leave it at there.